I'm Sam Hawley. Welcome to the Atomic Bomb. In this series, we're going to take a look at the world's first combat-deployed nuclear weapon, the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. We'll examine how the uranium in the bomb was manufactured, how the bomb was put together, and how it worked. And we'll explore topics like, could the bomb have failed? Could it have been a dud? And what did the Japanese know? Did they suspect that something big was coming? And what were the Japanese doing to develop a similar weapon? Stay tuned. All that's coming up. Before we get going, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like this kind of content. And give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Thanks. The U.S. Atomic Bomb Program, the Manhattan Project, developed two types of atomic bombs during World War II, a gun-type bomb and an implosion-type bomb. The Hiroshima bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, was a gun-type bomb. It worked by firing one subcritical mass of uranium into another to form a supercritical mass and in turn an explosion. The Nagasaki bomb, nicknamed Fat Man, was an implosion-type bomb. It had a hollow sphere of plutonium at its center, surrounded by an outer layer of shaped charges. When these charges were set off, they exploded inward to compress the plutonium sphere to create a supercritical mass. The gun-type method was much simpler than the implosion method. That's why it was used for the first atomic bomb, because it was so simple, less chance of something going wrong. The downside was that it was extremely inefficient. Of the 141 pounds of uranium that went into the Hiroshima bomb, less than two pounds of it actually fissioned. The rest simply vaporized when the bomb blew apart. It was effectively wasted. The gun-type method was in fact so inefficient, so wasteful, that it would be discarded soon after the war. Going into the Cold War, as the U.S. began to stockpile nuclear weapons, implosion became the detonation method of choice. Okay, so let's take a look at the uranium in the little boy bomb. It came from the Belgian Congo. It was dug out of a mine at a place called Shinkolobwe, which had a fantastically rich vein of uranium. Uranium ore from a more typical mine might contain, say, 1% uranium, if you're lucky. In the Shinkolobwe mine, it was 65% pure. To deflect attention from this valuable source, the story would subsequently be pushed that Canada was the source of much of the uranium in the bomb. But this was a smokescreen. The uranium in the Hiroshima bomb came from Africa, the Congo. All right, so now we have a supply of refined uranium, pure uranium metal, U on the periodic table. Let's take a look at it at the atomic level. These U atoms, there are actually two kinds of them in uranium. The vast majority, about 99%, contain 92 protons and 146 neutrons and are therefore called uranium-238. Uranium-238 atoms are non-fissile. That means that you cannot get a chain reaction going with them. You cannot make an atomic bomb out of uranium-238. The remaining atoms in uranium, meanwhile, less than 1%, contain the same number of protons, 92, but only 143 neutrons, three less than U-238. They are therefore called uranium-235. Uranium-235 is fissile. 
you can get a chain reaction going with U-235. So what does this mean exactly, a chain reaction? Here's a representation of natural uranium at the atomic level, a forest of U-238 atoms, an odd U-235 atom here and there, and an occasional stray neutron floating around. The stray neutron doesn't interact with the U-238 atoms. There's no attraction between them. It just floats on by. When a neutron stumbles on the odd U-235 atom, however, it's a different story. There's a major attraction between them. The neutron attaches itself to the U-235 atom, making it a U-236 atom, which is highly unstable. So unstable that it instantly splits in two, releasing a burst of energy and approximately three spare neutrons, which go floating off. Now, in natural uranium, there are so few U-235 atoms around that nothing else happens after that. These three spare neutrons that have just been released go floating off through the forest of U-238 atoms, and it'll be a while before they encounter another U-235 atom. So nothing else happens. But now imagine if there were U-235 atoms all around in every direction, that it was a whole forest of U-235, not U-238. These three spare neutrons released by the first split would immediately bump into three other U-235 atoms and cause them to split, each releasing their own bit of energy, and three more neutrons, a total of nine now. These nine neutrons would in turn cause nine other U-235 atoms to split, releasing still more energy, and 3 times 9 equals 27 neutrons, and so on and so on, an exponential increase in the amount of energy and the amount of neutrons being released that is so fast and so fierce that it results in just microseconds in a titanic explosion. Okay, so now we come to the difficult part. To make a bomb out of uranium, to make this chain reaction happen, you have to greatly increase the percentage of U-235 in your uranium, from its naturally occurring less than 1% to at least 20%. That's called highly enriched uranium. You could make a bomb out of highly enriched uranium, but it wouldn't be very powerful. What you really want is to increase your uranium even more, a whole lot more, so that at least 70% of the atoms are U-235. That's called weapons-grade uranium. With weapons-grade uranium, you can make a very serious bomb. The Manhattan Project used three different enrichment processes to produce weapons-grade uranium gaseous diffusion, liquid thermal diffusion, and electromagnetic separation. The work was done at a gigantic facility that was constructed at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The gaseous diffusion plant was here, K-25. It was the biggest building in the world up to that time, a half mile long and four stories high and the greatest single expense of the whole Manhattan Project. With the gaseous diffusion process, uranium hexafluoride, in gas form, was passed through a membrane to filter out uranium-235 atoms, which were ever so slightly smaller than U-238. A single pass through a gaseous diffusion separator didn't do very much. The uranium hexafluoride had to be passed through a whole series of separators, each raising the percentage of U-235 a little bit more. That's why the building was so big, because it contained hundreds of these separators. Up next, liquid thermal diffusion. The plant at Oak Ridge was here, S-50. In this process, uranium hexafluoride but in liquid form, was passed through a system that was heated on one side and cold on the other. U-235 atoms 
being slightly lighter, were drawn toward the heated side more readily than U-238. So a concentration of U-235 would build up on that side and could then be drawn off when it reached the other end. Finally, electromagnetic separation. Here's the plant, Y-12. In this process, uranium tetrachloride gas was ionized. In other words, it was given an electrical charge and then was passed through a magnetic field. This magnetic field would attract the ionized uranium atoms as they went past. And since uranium-235 atoms have a slightly lower mass, they would be attracted more. They would be drawn closer to it and would follow a different path as they passed through the separator. The gas collected at the other end would therefore have a higher concentration of U-235. None of these three processes were fully effective on their own. To achieve a weapons-grade level of enrichment, the uranium had to be processed multiple times, using two or more processes. A sample might start out at the electromagnetic separation plant, for example, where its level of enrichment might be raised to, say, 10 or 20 percent. Then it was passed on to the gaseous diffusion plant for further enrichment to weapons-grade level. The final degree of enrichment varied, since the uranium was processed in small batches. On average, though, it was about 80%. By the summer of 1945, the Oak Ridge complex had produced 141 pounds of weapons-grade uranium. It was cast into ring shapes, like this, in two different sizes, six and a quarter inches across and four inches across a total of 15 rings altogether. Considering the amount of time and effort and expense that went into making this stuff, it was arguably the most valuable substance in human history. So what was it like? Well, it was a dull gray metal, similar to iron or lead, but much heavier, almost as heavy as gold. With oxidation, it developed a purplish patina, Okay, now, is it warm? If I was writing a novel or a movie script, I'd want it to be warm for dramatic effect. You know, because it's radioactive. In reality, though, uranium-235 is not very radioactive, and it isn't warm. It has a shorter half-life than uranium-238, but it still runs to something like 700 million years. That's such a slow rate of decay that the energy released is nowhere near enough to warm up the metal to where you could actually feel it. Now, the plutonium in the Nagasaki bomb, that's a different story. Plutonium has a half-life of only 2.4 years. It releases energy at a much faster rate, so fast that it generates perceptible warmth. But not uranium. Weapons-grade uranium is room temperature, nothing more. So, we've accumulated a supply of weapons-grade uranium, enough for a bomb. In the next episode, we're going to start putting this stuff together. We're going to assemble Little Boy, the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Stay tuned. <laughs>